Good evening, everybody. We want to welcome you to our midweek service tonight. Tonight we're doing something different. We've been on the Revelation study for about two months, I think. And uh, tonight I want to talk about your vision. Give you the scriptures in Proverbs 29, 18. It says, where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. And as I was, I've, I've known that verse for probably 50 years or better. And But today, as I was going over it in my mind, it really, really struck home. Because when people don't have a vision, their life has no purpose. And uh, so I want to read a little definition of it here. Vision is the ability to see or see beyond your present state. And I like it. See beyond your present state. Or to see with great hope and expectations. Vision brings hope and a future to where you are right now. And God has the ability to see the end from the beginning and sometimes he gives us a glimpse of what is ahead. Jeremiah twenty nine eleven, very familiar scripture. For I know the thoughts I think towards you, saith the Lord, uh, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end or a future, or a future hope. And God has vision for your life, and his vision is better than what your vision is. And so I want you to get on the bandwagon with God and let you follow God and don't, uh, don't fight against God and let God's vision come uh, about in your life. Um, sometimes we don't know what's out there, but God does. But I just want to back up. Without a vision, the people perish. Because vision does give you that hope. If you if your vision is to see where you are right now, that's as far as you're going to go. If your vision is right here, and you may be even expect that life's going to get worse, uh, that that's uh, boy, that leads you down a pretty pretty dark road. But we need to look up and look towards Christ and know that God has something good in store for His people. Amen. And He does that. I'll give you a little, I don't know if it was a vision or not, but God spoke to me. Back in 1986, we were pastoring the church in Las Vegas, and uh, God spoke to me through the Spirit, and he told me to come to Versailles, Missouri, and start a church. And well, we came back uh, on vacation, and while we was here, we visited the, uh, on Sunday night, we visited the Assembly of God Church, and because uh, I, I didn't know there was a Pentecost Church of God across town, I really, at that time, I didn't know anything about the Pentecost Church of God, because I was pastoring a, ch a church of God. And uh, so we attended the, the attended the Assembly of God Church there. And uh, at night they had a good service. And the song leader, I uh, was a young man, uh, well, 30, what was it, 37 years ago, I think, 36, 37 years ago. Uh, boy, he was leading songs. And man, he was, he was marching around, running up and down the aisle, praising God, worshiping the Lord. And I thought, man, that's, that's a great song leader. And I thought, uh, well, we went back to Las Vegas. I thought, you know, God, maybe I, I, I don't know why I thought we should go to Versailles and start a church because there's a church there already uh, with a song leader that's uh, it's a good church. And uh, I didn't think that we needed to go start another one. But uh, two years later, 1988, we resigned the church in Las Vegas, moved back to uh, Jeff City, and because uh, that's where uh, we had family at that time. And uh, so we just started attending uh, uh, the, the uh, Jeff City Pentecostal Church of God. And now it's called Solid Rock Family Church. And Joe Skiles is the pastor there. And so we were involved in the church. You know, I was teaching a Sunday school class. And, and uh, life was pretty easy for us. When we were in Las Vegas, we pastored a 24-hour church that, uh, or a church in a 24-hour town that uh, you were busy all the time. I, I worked a full-time job to say, and then also. And so we were very, very busy. So by the time we resigned that church and came back to Missouri, we were kind of tired. And uh, I told the Lord, I said, God, I don't want to pastor a church and have to work again. I just, it takes its toll on you. But then uh, one day I was, I was praying and, and uh, I was getting ready to preach that night for Brother Skiles. And I was praying that morning. I said, God, if you want me to pastor a church and work again, I, I'll do it. I'll do it. And the week before, my brother-in-law and I, Mark, we had we were working down the lake. We came back through Versailles, and I knew about the little Pentecost church of God by that time. And I drove by it and saw the little building there, and and uh, there wasn't anybody around. And uh, you know, I, I just kind of in my spirit I said, I'd, if that church would come open, I would I would like to pastor. And this was this was like Thursday or Friday of, <clears throat> of the week, and I preached that next Sunday night for Joe Skiles, and Joe came up to me. Uh, after the service, he said, Brother Owsley said, there's a church came open this morning. Pastor resigned this morning, and he said that, uh, I think you could pastor that church. And I said, where's that? And he said, Versailles, Missouri. And uh, 
so long story short, we came down and we preached a few weeks and we were appointed as pastors on the last Sunday of July of 1990. And uh, we didn't actually come and start a church, but in a sense of the word, we did. The church was down to three ladies. Uh, one lady came back, so I usually say four ladies, and it was barely hanging on by the threads. They would, some Sunday mornings, maybe have a Sunday school class, and, uh, um, you know, that would be all they'd have for the entire week. And so when we get there, we're, we don't have a congregation. But, but the first week, we had enough family in the area that I can't remember what we had that first week. We might have had 12 or 15 people, which was very inspiring to these little ladies uh, because they had been having nobody. And so, uh, man, Brenda and I fell right in love with it. And man, we were excited about it, the opportunity to pastor this church. Long story short, we were, uh, we were uh, appointed as pastors of the church, and we began our work there. I was 40 years old when that took place, and uh, uh, it, it was exciting. It was exciting. Within a year's time, we were running about 100. Uh, it was a vision that God had for me and for my family, and it's a vision that I, I didn't know anything about, but God spoke to me to do that. And uh, it's here here tonight. I'm almost 33 years later. In July, it'll be 33 years that we have pastored this church. We moved out of that little building, which it was a nice little building. It was, And we moved into this new building that we built. There again, that was never in my, my sight, but it was in God's sight. We didn't just build the main building, but then we added on to it two different times. And... Uh, it's one of the larger churches in town at this present time. And uh, attendance-wise, we, we do about as well as anybody. The churches are down right now a little bit, but uh, we, we've been here. God, God told me, he said, when I left Las Vegas, he said, you've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many. That's scripture. Well, we get here, and I, we start passing out church, and we had four people, and I, I thank God. You said, You'd make me ruler over many. Well, that four wasn't many because in Las Vegas, we had a good church. It was around you know, 75 to 100 people sometimes. And uh, But as I look back, there have literally been thousands of people that have come through the doors of this church. And we minister to their lives one way or another. So, so God is uh, true to his word. And that was a vision. My vision today, 33 years later, is to keep on keeping on. I know that God's not through with this church. My vision now is to see this church get a second win and really begin to move forward. I'm at the age now to where I'm ready for younger people to come in and start taking key roles in this church. And I'm I'm putting that appeal out there. If you're a on fire for God, young person that loves the Lord, uh, that you play music or you preach or you sing or you just want to attend church and be a major part, our doors are open to you because some of these days we will step aside uh, and then a new generation will take over. But God had a purpose for this church. God had a vision for this church, and we are here today because of that. So our, our vision was exciting, and, and uh, we were thrilled to be here. And uh, so we came with the excitement to do that, and, and uh, our vision was one of growth and revival. We didn't just come down here to pastor that little church and for it to remain the same. I didn't think anything about building a church that time, but we, we uh, wanted the church to move forward and, uh, and to touch people's lives and to win souls, to make, a, make an impact in the community. And uh, we've done that. We've done that. We've had a lot of revivals over the years and a lot of singing groups. And, and uh, God has blessed us in this way. In 1996, we had a revival with Brother Mike Riles. It started out as a three-day revival and lasted 11 weeks. And it went night after night. And... Uh, and uh, hundreds of people would come to that revival. And so God's done some uh, great things. We've seen souls saved. We've seen life, lives changed. Uh, we've seen families put back together. We've seen miracles take place. And uh, there's people out there that started coming back to the church and people come. I don't know where those people are. I can't go knock, knock on somebody's door and say, you're supposed to be in our church. But God just began to bring them in, one after another after another. And many of them are still in this church today and key members of this church. Uh, so you see, God has a vision. And God has a vision for you, whatever your vision. I want you to think about your vision tonight. You might be sitting there thinking, well, I don't really know what that might be. Well, I didn't either. All I know is that God told me to come to Versailles, Missouri and start a church. Well, it took four years for that to happen, uh, but we did it. And, and we're here today 
uh, because of that. Amen. So uh, God has a plan for you. And uh, uh, in your life, in my life, or anybody's life as a Christian, God expects us to, to expand and to grow. God doesn't want you to stay stagnant in where you are with your relationship with God. You Think individually first. Think your relationship with God, where are you? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian. i just barely hanging on. No, that's not good enough. You need to be a Christian that's on fire for God, that's into your word every day and reading that word. You need to be praying every day and talking to God. You need to be witnessing in your neighborhood or your job or whatever it might be. You need to begin to expand what God has given you. Amen. And uh, so uh, God has a plan for you. Well, I want to back up to one thing. When we uh, uh, came here, there was a lady in our church uh, there, and I, I, can't, uh, I can't remember who she was or name or anything. But when we were there, we started making plans because we were growing. We needed more room. So we made plans on building onto the side of that old church. Well, for some reason, well, God's reason, that never happened. But then about 1996, uh, I took a piece of cardboard out, and uh, I drew the plans for this church on the back of that cardboard. That was our blueprint. That was our blueprint. I don't think they'd let you do that today. But I went to City Hall and asked them what we needed, and they said, just build. And so God was with us all the way, and we built this church. But uh, the property for this church was bought in about in the 70s, 1970s, with the purpose of building a church uh, on this property. Well, it never happened. As a matter of fact, the church in the 70s was running about, uh, about 100, 120 people and doing really well, but then it went dwindled down, dwindled down to almost nothing to the point to where the doors were about closed. And I want you to just stop and think that right there. You may have been flying high at one time, but something's happened in your life and it's brought you down to a new low. Don't accept the fact that that's where you're going to stay. We could have accepted the fact that this church in the Lord of Hales was, uh, was, uh, was through. And the district could come in, they could have closed the door, sold the building, and it would become a, a garage or something. And the uh, church south of the town, they did that. They sold it and it turned it into a garage. It could have been the end of this church, but that wasn't the end of God's vision. So God chose me. Amen. He knew who was uh, gullible enough to come in here to believe that we could take a church and four people and do something with it. I just trusted God. I didn't know any better. I did. I loved the Lord. I was excited about the opportunity to pastor His church, and God blessed it. And God, God honored that. But uh, there's a lady. Uh, I get back to that. There's a lady uh, in our church, blonde-headed lady. I don't know. I, I wish I could remember who she was. But anyway, she came and she says I, she saw a vision of a church on this piece of property on the corner of Second and Jones, and she said it was the biggest church in town. And uh, you know, I thought, well, she's kind of kind of dreaming a little bit there. That's, uh, that's far from ever being a possibility. But uh, today we stand here and our building probably is the largest one-story church in town. We got to start out with 10,000 feet. We now we got over 18,000 square feet uh, in this property. But that's not, that's not the purpose of this church. The purpose of this church is to, is to reach people. And we, and we utilize this 18,000 square feet on uh, Wednesday night. Uh, we have right now, we've had, at one time, we were running a 65-passenger bus, three 15-passenger vans, and we were filling them up and bringing kids in to uh, the church. And so on a Wednesday night, we were running, my goodness, uh, probably 100, 150 people on Wednesday night uh, just to, uh, to to minister to them. So you see that we didn't build the building for the purpose of saying we've got a big building. We built the building for the purpose of saying we've got uh, facilities to be able to minister to people. We had an area for the youth, an area for the little kids, an area for the adults. And today, uh, we we still are there. We're, we're not nearly that big now, but we're doing really well. Uh, we've got about 30 teenagers that come on Wednesday night. And, um, and, and this is the beautiful thing about this. They're not kids that come to church here on Sunday, most of them. Probably 90% 90, 90 of them at least are kids that just come from the neighborhoods or we go out in the van and pick them up and bring them in. And they come for this reason, because they want to be in church. And they're learning something about the Word of God. And, and over the years, when you talk about uh, almost 30 years of youth ministry, we've impacted a lot of people. We've got, we've got people in our church right now that grew up as youth, and now they're here with their kids. 
And you see, this is a vision God puts together. So let me back up there. Can I want to tell you, when, when that church almost became non-existent, maybe your life's there right now. Maybe you feel like all the wind has gone out of your sail and there's nothing for you to do or to accomplish and your life is just about over. Your ministry is just about over. Don't believe that. Don't accept that. When God spoke something into your heart, the Bible says the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. So when God spoke to you and told you he wanted you to do something, he still means it, amen. So don't give up on God. Don't give up on the possibility that you have uh, to go forth and to do something uh, really great for the Lord, amen. So over the last years, we have seen a lot of things happen. A lot of things happen. Uh, new ministries. We've had a lot of different types of ministries in this church. And uh, we, we adapted the... Uh, adopted the uh, slogan a few years back and says it's the family worship center it's more than just a church it's family and it is it is we we love the people that come here we the most of them love us uh you know we've had a really and i'm not saying this braggingly we've had a really successful pastorate here a term of, of ministry here not because of i'm, I'm a, such a great preacher not because I'm so educated that I know it all, not because I'm the, the best administrator, but it's because God has blessed our lives because we are faithful to him. And you'll find that to be true too. If you'll just be faithful to God, God will bless you. And God will take you to new heights and new places that you, you never never dreamed you could be. Amen. So, so let's look at your vision where you are right now. As the scripture said, without a vision, the people perish. Amen. And God wants you to get inspired and encouraged about what God has in store for you. Get a vision. Amen. Uh, there's been a lot of things that have been taking place. Uh, I, I preached this sermon quite a few times, or, or a topic out of a sermon. There was a preacher by the name of uh, Brother Hill, and he, he was a holding a revival in North Carolina. And he came to this one church, and he preached the revival, and he had a prayer line, this young woman comes up and he, Brother Hill asked her, he said, what, what does you need? And she said, I need a husband. And he asked her, he said, what kind of husband do you want? She said, I don't care. Just any kind of husband. I just need a husband. He said, I'm not going to pray for that. He said, I want you to be intentional. You might get a husband that would beat you every day before he went to work. Set lazy. Maybe he wouldn't even work. Maybe he'd lay around and make you work. You, you don't want that kind of life. So pray intentionally for what you want. And she says, okay, she says, I want a husband that's tall, dark-haired, good-looking, musically inclined, got a great job, loves God, loves the church, loves to sing, and uh, that's what I want, amen. So Brother Hill prayed for her that that would take place, and that was her vision. See, she, she spoke her vision, what she wanted. She said, God, this is what I need in my life. And uh, so Brother Hill prayed for her. And about a year later, he came back to that church for another revival. He's up on the platform, and he looks out, and he sees this young woman sitting there. And there's a tall, dark-haired man sitting beside her. And after the service uh, was over, she came and said, Brother Hill, I am so glad you told me to pray intentionally. And uh, this, this is my husband. And he's tall, and he's dark-haired, he's good-looking. And he's a music teacher at the high school. He loves God with all of his heart. He sings and he plays instruments. He's a, he's a great man of God. That was a vision. So your vision, don't give up on your vision. Ask God for what your vision might be. Amen. James tells us in James 4 verse 2, he says, you have not because you ask not. And sometimes we don't receive because we ask amiss. We ask for something silly or something dumb. But when you ask according to God's will, God's going to bless you and God's going to make that come to pass. Amen. And uh, so when you begin to pray and ask God to spend time with God, allow his spirit to begin to rub off on you. It'll bring influence into your life. It'll inspire you. It will lead you when you spend time with God. Have you spent time with God lately? Or is God just somebody you come into contact with from time to time when you don't have anything else to do? Or is God that one that you only go to in time of need? God, I need help. Is that who God is to you? Or is he your constant companion that you love? You wake up in the morning and you say, good morning, Lord. You wake up in the morning and you can't wait to get into his word and find out his instruction for your life that day. 
You wake up at that morning and you can't wait to get out of the world with the Spirit of God bubbling over in your soul and begin to influence people you come into contact with. When you, when you, when you come into contact with somebody, you're going to rub off on them with the presence of God just a little bit. You're going to say, God bless you. Have a great day. God loves you. Whatever the situation might be, are you going to make, is that your intention? Well, when the Holy Spirit of God gets a hold of you, it will. <clears throat> Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the thoughts I have for you of a thoughts of a future and not a hope. God says, I don't have bad plans for you. I've got good plans for you. And that's, that's what God says for you today. God doesn't want to bring bad things into your life, but God wants to bring good things into your life. Amen. Good things for you and your family. Amen. Now listen to God. Don't listen to Satan because Satan will take you down a road you don't want to go down. He'll lie to you, first of all. He'll make you think you're going after good things, but really it's just a facade. It's a lie. It'll vanish right in front of your eyes. Amen. So listen to God. Amen. There was a man that came to Jesus one day, and um, he said, my son, uh, I guess we could probably call it epilepsy. He said he, he was it really his demon possessed what it was. And uh, he said he foams at the mouth. He falls into the fire. He falls into the water. Uh, this thing is trying to kill him. And he said, I took my son to your disciples and see if they could do anything for him. And uh, they, they couldn't. They, they prayed, but nothing happened. Amen. And so he asked Jesus this question. Can you do anything? And we see in Matthew 9, verse 23. Amen. He, he said this. Uh, he, he said, uh, if you can believe, if you can come to the place in your life, you can believe. Now, I want to stop right there before I finish the rest of that, that scripture. If you can come to the place in your life to where you can believe, faith can begin to rise in your heart. Your whole life will change. Your whole world will change because you won't look at everything in the negative, but you'll begin to look at things in the positive and you'll begin to decide, you know what? I'm not staying here any longer. I'm rising up. I'm moving forward. I'm changing my life. Good things are going to happen. And he told his man, he said, if you can believe, all things are possible. All things are possible. And you know what he told Jesus? He said, Lord, I believe but help thou mine unbelief. In other words, he said, I don't want any doubt in my life. I don't want any unbelief in my life. I want to rise above that and come to the place to where I can just simply believe God, simply trust in God and just stand back and see the mighty, wonderful works of God begin to take place in, uh, in your life. Amen. I, I, I could just ramble on tonight about uh, so many people that have prayed for different things and they believed uh, for not being able to have children and they prayed and they had a child and never having a home to live in. They prayed and God gave them a house. Uh, walking and God gave them a car. On and on and on. Uh, single and God gave them a spouse. Uh, God is there for you. If you can only believe, put your faith in the Lord. Amen. God's going to do something for you. I love this scripture. I love, I love Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse uh, 13. But the first uh, 15 verses are talking about the things, that they're good things. And it's saying if you can hear the word, read the word, obey the word, God's going to bless you. And this is one of the things he said. He said, if the Lord shall make you the head and not the tail, thou should be above and only and not beneath, if thou, if thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day, to observe and to do them. Amen. In the first part of the chapter, he said, he said if, you, if you seek the Lord, he said, the blessings of God will come up on you and overtake you. In other words, he said, you can't outrun the blessings of God. When you totally commit your life to God, you're going to find the miracle working hand of God active in your life. Life is going to bless you and things are going to turn around and change for you. Amen. So if you'll just uh, follow the word of God, expect uh, good things uh, to happen in your life, they will. Amen. My life has uh, far exceeded anything I would have ever expected. I uh, never expected, to, well, first of all, I wasn't a Christian when I was growing up. And so I never expected to be in a church at all. That was not part of my plan, but God had a plan. He saved me and started using me as a young uh, 18, 19-year-old boy. I didn't know my head from home the ground. 
but I was teaching Sunday school class. I was leading Royal Rangers in the Assembly of God Church. And I didn't really know how to do that, but God put me in those places to teach me to learn how to, to walk with them. And God just, all of my life, I look back, God's had his hand on me, and I've been obedient to God, and I've followed what God wanted me to do, and God made a way. Now, I want you to know something. You may think, you know, I don't know how to do that. Well, this is what God does. God doesn't call the equipped. God didn't just go out there and find somebody that's super intelligent, that's super educated in the Bible, that's uh, been raised in church all their life. That's not who he usually gets. But he doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. So if God calls you, he will equip you and make you able to do the job that God has called you to do. As we look back when Jesus was calling his disciples, he didn't go to the synagogue. He did not find one of those renegade disciples in the synagogue. He found them on a fishing boat, uh, doing whatever they were doing on that fishing boat. He found them at the tax collector. He found all kinds of just ordinary people that were not equipped for the job, but he brought them into his his bosom. Can I say it that way? He brought them into his atmosphere in, and a relationship with him, and he rubbed off on them. And he rubbed off on them in such a way that it changed their life to a degree that they never were the same again. They had literally come from the place to where they were satisfied with their life as they were, but they came to the place where they couldn't live without Christ. They were even willing to die for Christ, willing to go forward for Christ. So God will change you. Amen. And uh, in the past, I don't know, I've been, I think, saved uh, 52, 54 years, something like that. Uh, God's never let me down. He's always been there for me. Now, I've, I've messed up, and I've let me down. I've stumbled and I've fell, but I've always gotten back up. But God has never let me down. Every time I'd fall and look up, he'd have his hand reach down to me, and I'd get back up and keep on going uh, for the Lord. Amen. God offers wisdom, and I refuse. I can expect to fail. But when God offers correction, and I disobey, I can expect chastisement. But in all of that, also, God has a plan for your life. Amen. He's there. He never leaves you. Uh, finishing up tonight, we see a scripture in, in uh, James chapter 4, verse 10. Uh, God never leaves you. Amen. And God has a plan for you and your failures, and he's still there. He never, never leaves us. It says this in James 4, 8, 4, 10. Humble yourself, therefore, in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Just give yourself to God. Don't try to figure it out on your own. Just humble yourself. In 1 John 1 and 9 says, We confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is the Apostle John speaking to the church. And he says, If you'll confess your sins, so he understands that we're human. He understands we're going to fail, we're going to fall down. But he also understands if you'll confess, ask God to forgive you, he'll pick you up and he'll restore you and keep you on the right path. Amen. So tonight I'm going to leave you with this. Sharpen, I want to challenge you to sharpen your vision in righteousness and in godly living, and you'll find that God will bless you through it. And you will, uh, in a year's time or even less, you'll be places you couldn't dream that you could be. God bless you. Come and see us this weekend. We'd love to have you in our services.